I, I really want to talk about breaking off the fear of man that's holding us back from being the fullest potential of who God's called us to be. That's, that's, that's the main message this morning. So if you don't remember anything, you can write that down. And when, when you go home and your spouse asks you, well, what was it about this morning? You say, oh, it was about breaking off the fear of man. You know, um, if you fall asleep later, at least you'll know that. Um, I mean, if you're meditating on the Lord and your eyes are closed. <laughs> and um, Also be praying for the people at Flourish. And, and you, you might see that we're, we're a little light this morning. We had over 60 people uh, at uh, this uh, in, encounter retreat and um, they're just getting really touched. And so um, uh, be praying for them. See, we, we were always formed and called to host the Spirit of God. How many know that Paul wrote that we are temples of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of God rests within us? You know, when you look at, when you study, uh, just from the beginning of Genesis, when you study uh, Israel and uh, when you're in seminary, they kind of share that and, and teach you that, you know, the, these are the people of Israel, God's chosen people. God called them, uh, called Abraham out of Ur and, and, uh, and, and, and kind of went through this series. You can, if you read the Old Testament, you read all about it. They become the people of Israel, God's chosen people. And when you um, study them, they'll also teach you about the surrounding people of that time. And they kind of categorize all those people, many from different tribes and, and different, they have different religions and different gods and all those things. And we kind of categorize them as the ancient Near Eastern people that were around Israel. And so you have Israel, and then you have the ancient Near Eastern people. And when you hear about the stories of those people and the story of Israel, you see how God is positioning himself to show himself as the one true God, the God above all other gods, the God who was before and who will be last. He's outside of time. He's eternally God compared to the ancient Near Eastern gods. And, and you'll, you'll hear stories like, I mean, they all have different weird stories where it's like gods were warring together and fighting and the drop of the blood of the gods had formed humanity in the world. And, and you'd have these kind of stories. You can read them yourself if you want. They're kind of weird. But, um, but then you hear the, the Judeo-Christian God, our God, and says, there was no gods warring. Our God, there was only one God. And he just spoke and it came. And then the ancient Near Eastern people, you see that they, 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 they would make temples. The, 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 the people of that time, humanity, would make temples and then would ask their gods to fill it. And they would put you know, idols in there, like handmade idols. But when you read in Genesis, God said, no, 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 I make the temples, and then, which is you, and dwell in it. You read, you read on the seventh day, it said that God rested. And we all have this picture, I don't know, at least I did growing up, that God went up to heaven and he was like, six days of speaking, that was hard. I need it this seventh day. And I know there's a principle there that you know, we can take from, but the reality is it wasn't that he was tired because he rested. When you see, when you actually read it, it says that on the seventh day, it says that when he made creation, that he rested in it, and some, some translations say on it. And what is he talking about? Us. We were always meant to be temples of the Lord. Sin came in the world, a chasm between God and man came, and there was a rebellion against God. And, uh, and because uh, of that separation, as it was prophesied, Jesus, who was fully God, uh, became fully man, and he became is fully incarnate God and fully man the whole time, and uh, born of a virgin, lives a sinless life, dies on the cross, an atoning sacrifice for our sins, redeems humanity, and restores that relationship back with God. And then he it was witnessing to everyone for 40 days, resurrected Jesus. After three days, he re resurrected and was around for 40 days. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people saw Jesus. He spent time with them. It wasn't like a few people saw him rise and then it was like, boom, he was gone. It says that he was with them 40 days. And during that time, he's like, make sure you go back and pray for the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit to come upon you in Jerusalem. Go back to Jerusalem and pray. Don't start this without me, without it. And says that on the uh, 10th day after 40 days, it would be the 50th day, he ascends into heaven. It says that they were all staring at him ascending into heaven. And it says that a cloud uh, consumed him. And, and, and I just want you to see this. Like, 
It wasn't that Jesus was ascending and then it was a cloudy day and they couldn't see him anymore. It wasn't like he just kept going into outer space and he was flying past Mars and, and he's just, just going. No, this cloud was a Shekinah glory cloud. It's the same word. It's like, it's like he, he ascended up into heaven and he went into the dimension of heaven. And they were, it said that the disciples were in so shock, they were staring, that they were staring into heaven so long that two men dressed in white, angels, had to come and tap them on the shoulder and say, what are you doing staring into heaven? Go to Jerusalem and pray that heaven comes into you. And so they pray for 10 days. They pray and pray. 10 days is, is, is actually Pentecost when the, Holy, when the Spirit of God uh, falls on them. Sorry about that. He ascended on the 40th day, 10 days later. The Spirit of God falls on them. And I always wonder, how long would I have lasted in that upper room? How long would you have lasted? I mean, one day you're like, yeah, let's do it, guys. Jesus, just pour your spirit out upon us, Lord. We believe what you said is true. You know, we're convinced. Two days later, we're like, um, we're still doing it. We're still doing it. Three days. All right, guys, Jesus rose again three days. Come on, this is it. Four days. You know, Jesus has this verse. He says, you know, knock and, it's, and, and, and the door will open. Seeking, you'll find. Um, asking will be given to you. And the way it's actually said is, um, is written is in continuation. It means n- knock and keep on knocking. Seek and keep on seeking. Ask and keep on asking. And the door will be open to you. And you will find. And you will receive. And too often I do this. <laughs> 30 seconds. Well, I guess it's not coming today. When the, when the disciples were like, and Jesus makes this clear as he's teaching the disciples, he's like, you know, if a neighbor came to you in the middle of the night knocking on the door persistently, wouldn't you just give him that bread just to send him away? I mean, he's giving us this imagery of knocking, asking, seeking in the constant. And the whole idea is that we would receive the Spirit of God, we would persist until we see that breakthrough. And, um, and, and so now as Christians who've received Christ, when you receive Christ, you receive the Spirit of Christ, and we are now temples of the Holy Spirit, we are born again, we are ambassadors for God, and there's a constant decision that we have to make to either follow what the Spirit's doing, where God is leading us or follow what man's doing. And the problem that often arises is that we constantly seek approval from people. And when you seek approval, the the people who you seek approval from most are the people you fear most. The people who you, if you seek approval from God the most, you fear God the most. Come on, are you guys here? It's like, okay. Look at Proverbs 29, 25. It says, the fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. Another version says, a dangerous trap. See, oftentimes we have this addiction for approval. And when we have this addiction for approval, we're living with the fear of man, maybe without even realizing it. I, 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 I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's hard not to mention this so much, but I, I recently did a fast. I did a social media fast. I was like, man, I am just, I just got done it, and I just kept it going because I was like, I just want to see what difference this makes in my life. Because I know there's, there's, you know, things you can do to stay up with family and pictures. There's good parts of it. But it was on my phone and I just saw that without even noticing, I would look to see if I had any status updates and if, if anyone posted anything new. Like all those little five minute spaces of time that I had, sometimes I would look and I'd say, what is going on? And, and so I just, you know, I felt like I should give, give it up for 21 days. I was like, okay, I deleted the apps off my phone and then, um, and then, 20, and then just like two days later, 
I like my, my head felt clearer. I didn't feel like I was looking for, you know, mental stimulation all the time. And, and, uh, and then, and then, you know, it's funny. I never had this before, but like four days later, I get a, I get an email from Facebook says, uh, so-and-so commented on your timeline. (laughs) Click here to see it. It's like, what? It's like, they're like, quick, quick, we're losing another customer, you know, like, and then five or six days later, I get a text message from them. Another person commented on your, click here to see it. I was just like, no, get out in Jesus' name, you know. (laughs) Now, now that I'm off the MeFest, I I think I'm just going to like check for updates once in a while on my computer, but I'm just not, I'm just not going to put it on my phone anymore. It's too accessible. And, um, but, but social media kind of has this thing where it makes you a desire for approval, right? How many likes did I get? If you ever, if you, if you, you know, when I first started preaching, oh, this was a hard one. Can I be just a little honest with you? When I first started preaching, I would, um, I would, uh, you know, they would have videos of me upload it. And that was before when they had a thumbs up button and a thumbs down button. And, you know, it could be like a hundred thumbs up and five thumbs down. I'm like, why is this five thumbs down? What did I do? Did it, can I find out who thumbed down me? Like, maybe I can talk to them, you know? Like, what is wrong with me that I would want to seek that, you know, that, that even care about that? You know, it's because I'm, because I, what, I, what I'm looking for is this approval, even from men, from women, right? From people. And we can get sucked into this so easily. You know, fear does this thing for, to us where, um, you know, there's the, there's the fight or flight response. But even more common, I think, is the freeze response. Have you ever been so scared you're just frozen? I mean, have you ever, like, I, I mean... You know me in, in videos, I, I have these, I'm not going to show it this morning, but not now, but later you got to look it up, okay? It's, it's like, there's this Chinese bridge that they built that's really high in the air, like really high on the side of a mountain, and this is so mean. They put glass along the whole bridge, this walking bridge, and not only that, they have like a little monitor underneath that while they're walking, it starts to crack when they get to the middle of it. I mean, it's mean. But what's amazing is people ins- instinctively go, go down on all fours. And they're walking like this. I mean, there's railings on the bridge and everything. But because the fear of heights is so strong that they, they start doing this, and then eventually they just hold on to the bars and they close their eyes. And we're enjoying their fear. But, but besides that, you know, Jesus, forgive us, bless them, Lord, you know, besides that, what does fear do? But it keeps you in the state of not progressing. I don't know about you, but I've struggled this sometimes all my life where I'm seeking the approval of even people I don't even know, you know, might, might affect the way I dress, might affect the way I talk, might affect, I mean, I think they even do this with tipping. I, I, I don't know about you, but tipping has gotten out of control lately. Can I just say what I'm thinking? I'm like, I go to a food truck and then, they, and then their options for tipping, I go, I walk up to them, I order, and then they're like, do you want us to tip 20, 25%, 30% or other? I'm like, good Lord. And then, and then they're like, here's a pager. Come back and pick it up when it's ready. I'm like, what am I doing here? You know? Now, of course, if I'm not trying to, any, any servers here that serve you at a table, I think you should be tipped, okay? All right, not, and bless your waiters, bless your all this. But, but there is this, this thing where it's like, you know, this big screen's in front of you and everyone's behind you and you're like, and you want this person not to be upset and you want this, you know, and so you're like, yeah, I'll, you know, you sometimes you just click that or, or when you're at the grocery store and they're like, um, oh, your total is $750. Um, 
and you're like, and they're like, would you like to add two dollars to starving children? And they say it real loud, and you're like, I have starving children at home, thank you. No, I do give to charity, but uh, but what is that? It's it's all generated, right? To for the approval, right? So that and so I I feel like. Um, we allow fear to control us and when we really should look for the approval of God. Look at Galatians 1, 10 through 12. It says, for, I, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I wouldn't be a servant of Christ. For I would have... I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through the revelation of Jesus Christ. One of the big reasons, I think, there's big struggles for not sharing the gospel so openly with so many people is because we have this fear of man. And we're wondering, how are they gonna receive it how are they going to react to it? What are they going to do when we approach them with it? Or maybe even talk to our friends and family members or coworkers. And the reality is we've made these judgments about how they're going to respond. And we've, we've oftentimes put it into a negative context. You know, I had this um, person who was, who was helping me becoming uh, a better person, better man. And um, my father grew up without a father. Uh, his father died when he was nine years old. And um, uh, that affected how he raised me. So I was raised by a fatherless father. He tried his best. He was loving. He was amazing. But there were certain things he didn't instill in me that, that I think if he had a father, it would be instilled. And so I, 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 I needed help. I, I went to other good character people who were fathers and just learned from them. And, um, and, and so I was talking with this person. And they, they were asking me uh, about, you know, me, you know, just having fear and anxiety about something. And I was just like, well, you know, because I knew if I would have responded this way, they would have reacted that way because that's the way they think. And he said, oh, how do you know that's the way they think? And I was like, oh, I just know. And he's like, well, you actually don't have a right. Who, who are you to think that you have a right to know how someone's going to think or respond? Sounds pretty arrogant to me, Paul. How about you don't worry about how other people think or respond, and you only worry about how you think and respond, and let them be who they are so you can be who you are. And I was just like totally blew my eyes. I was like, you're right, I am not a mind reader. I keep thinking, I keep making these judgments. Oh, this person would never receive that. I saw how they reacted in this situation. They're going to react in a different situation with me. And, and so I'm just going to avoid that. It's like, no, Jesus has called us to freedom. Jesus has called us to look for only the approval of God. If you're, if you're living by the fear of man and the approval of man, then every context that you're in, you will live an anxiety filled life because you'll, you'll constantly be conforming to that. Look, if you're, if you're looking for the approval of man, what, what would I say? If you're looking for the approval of man, you come to church, you're going to act like a Christian. Because that's how everyone acts in church. But you go to work, someone says an off-color joke. If you're looking for the approval of man, you'll laugh at that joke. Maybe join in. Go to a party. Or is it a little bit immoral? If you're looking for the approval of man constantly, you'll constantly conform to the context of where you find yourself. And I don't know about you, but that eventually wears you out. But when you have the character to say, I'm not gonna look for the approval of man, I wanna look for the approval of God, I want the approval of God in my life, then when you come to church, you come to church, you're living righteously because God's made you righteous and because you wanna live by his standards and then you go to work and someone says an off-color joke and, and, 
And instead of having fear of being an outcast, instead of having fear of someone saying, oh man, Paul, you're just a, you're just a, you know, whatever. Prude, Prude thank you. <laughs> and then them not including you ever again. You say, hey man, that's not appropriate. I don't appreciate that around me. You know, I had this vision when I was um, in ministry school because I was still seeking, without even realizing it, the approval of man, which meant that I had the fear of man still on me. And I remember the Lord giving me this vision of me being old, still bald, <laughs> in, in a river, I think it's like the river of God, and I was just floating down the river totally free. And, you know, the image had emotion to it. And I just felt, oh, this, this is what it feels like to finally understand exactly who I am in Christ, where I no longer care about what people think about me. I only care about what God thinks about me. And God was showing me that that is the most freeing feeling you will ever get. Now, there's... there's there's ditches on both sides of this thinking. Like, like you can, oh man, I'm getting, I'm getting all over on my notes, but um, you can have the fear of man on one side of the ditch, but if you go too far to the other side of the ditch and you're just, you can be just stuck in your flesh, not caring about anyone else, okay? You, you still need to have character of God and the righteousness of God where you care about people. You just don't look for their approval. Jeremiah 17, five through seven says, thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He, ha he shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. You think about Peter, who always stuck his foot in his mouth and, 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 and Jesus was just totally mentoring. He was in the, he was in the inner circle of Jesus' disciples and, uh, and he confesses he'll never deny him. He'll never betray him. He's like, Jesus, you can trust me. I'm your top dog. And then his world gets turned upside down. While Jesus was on the cross, he's denying three times. This girl comes up to you, you got a funny accent. Are you from Galilee? Oh, no, no, I'm not that guy. But you, it's like someone from the Bronx. Have you ever heard someone from the Bronx talk? You know. You know, like, I can't do it real good. Rick, just talk a little bit. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, but it's like, they can't deny it. You know, it's, it's kind of like that. You, she heard his accent. No, you're, you're, I've seen you. You're the one who actually, I'm not him. Starts cursing, Right? The guy who thought he was so bold in his own strength, what he was doing, he realized that actually he wasn't as strong as he thought he was. Now, fast forward, the Holy Spirit falls on him. And now he's empowered with boldness. And now he doesn't care if he gets martyred. Now he's like, Adam, I'm not seeking the approval of the religious leaders in this area. I just want to seek the approval of God. And when you live your life like that, it's the freest feeling in the world, in your life. All right. In the context of evangelism, we need to be able to share the gospel with that kind of freedom. If they're really your friends, they'll love you even if they disagree with you. And stop letting them live in the dark. Open up to them. Share with what God's done in your life. Don't look for just their approval. But, but, but you know, like, if we get so scared 
of moving in that kind of power, if we get so scared of moving in that kind of freedom that we're like those people clinging on the bridge and that's like, if that was to represent our life and we're holding onto these bars and then we die and go to eternity and we show up in heaven before God and we're like, hey! And he's like, what did you do with what I gave you? I was really scared. I was just clinging on. How about when I told you to go talk to this person and, and go invite this person over your house and do all, well, I was afraid of what they would think. All right, I, I, you know, I think a lot of us have this wish, but you know, when I was going in high school, I cared a lot about what people thought about me. And now that I'm an adult, I wish I could redo high school with my knowledge now. Why? Because I would have been such a better version of me. I would have been able to see past their lies. I would not be influenced by their opinions, right? Because I am now a better version, a more mature version of myself now than I was then. Well, listen, right now, you still have the same opportunity. You're, it's, it's high school, but now you're just older. So take advantage of it. Don't live in regret. Go, man, I just wish I had that, that boldness. You know, uh, uh, I wish I could have had my boldness now back then in high school because I would have told so-and-so what was what. Well, you could still have that boldness now for, t- for today to go forward, to tell people about the gospel, to share about the love of God, to share about, about how God can save their life, to, to, to invite people to, to things like church, your, your home, the Jesus gathering that's coming. The, these are all ways to, to do this. Um, one of the messages on my life that I love to preach, uh, and I actually wrote a book about it. I've never told anyone this um, because it's just weird promoting your own book. Um, this is the best book to read. Every topic that you ever need to read is in this book. My book would just be a supplement to, that, to this book. But, um, there's a, but the message on my life is the gospel of God's peace, the power of God's peace, because it's so powerful. I talk about how... how you know, in the armor of God, we, when we look at the armor of God, you have the helmet of salvation, you have the belt of truth, the, 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 right, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit. I remember in children's church, them always, you know, having this plastic, you know, armor that they would show all the children and be like, they'd have all these great illustrations with it. And, but, you know, the helmet of salvation's on the head, the sword of the spirit, uh, uh, the, the, the shield of faith, the belt of truth, and they'd have all these great illustrations, breastplate of righteousness. But when it came to the peace, they'd be like, and you'll have shoes of peace. And you'll have peace. I used to think the apostle Paul just like ran out of body parts. He's like, ah, we'll put the shoes on the feet. You know, we'll put the peace on the feet. Ran out of body parts. But it's not a coincidence that that Paul put the shoes of the gospel of peace on the feet because it doesn't matter how well you hold your shield or wave your sword. If you don't have his peace, you're not going anywhere because his peace is that powerful. His peace advances the kingdom of God. It even says, go two by two, find the house of peace. And Jesus says that we're called to be peacemakers. And this is my point. Too many of us try to be peacekeepers. And peacekeepers are full of anxiety because they're trying to get multiple parties to agree on one thing and they're appeasing everybody. Some of us do it with our families. Some of us do it in our work relationships. Some of us do it in projects. Some of us do it just with everybody. We just want to please everybody. And the reality is you end up being a peacekeeper and peacekeepers don't get much done. I've just, just historically speaking. But when you're not, having the fear of man. When you're not always seeking the approval of people and you just want to seek the approval of God, your mindset changes from being a peacekeeper to a peacemaker where you bring God's kingdom into a situation and you're not afraid about how they'll respond. You actually let it sit there and you stand comfortably at peace. And what, what happens in these situations when you, when you really learn how to become a true peacemaker is that you will find yourself underqualified, 
in the situations that are way over your head, but because you're the one who has God's peace and because you're the one who's actually bringing a kingdom perspective, everyone in the area will look to you. Happens time and time again. I have friends who've been in different markets in the world and they just ask for God to give them insight about a troubling situation in their workplace or um, some, some, some of them are very involved in politics and all of a sudden they become the expert in the room because they're the only one who's bringing a kingdom perspective to the situation and they don't care about what anyone thinks about them. Everyone starts changing instead of saying, well, a peacemaker is like, well, if you compromise here and if you compromise here and you compromise here, then, then maybe we can all be at peace and everyone will be unhappy. <laughs> but a peacemaker brings in a perspective where everyone has to give up their idea and join the kingdom's idea. And so what am I saying? For evangelism, to get this city saved, okay, which is the vision, the mission for us. How many know that 60, do you know that 60% of Albuquerque, it's between 50 and 60% of the population of New Mexico live in Albuquerque and the surrounding areas, and if we get them saved, 60% of New Mexico will get saved. I don't know too many places you could do that. What a testimony would it be to change a whole state by changing a city? Come on, that's pretty amazing. The opportunity God's giving us, it's amazing. So, for us to do that, for us to advance God's kingdom in that way, we need to break off this fear of man and reorient ourselves to say, I'm not gonna fear man, I'm gonna just fear you, God. And the approval I seek is for you. Now, I'm not saying don't be a bad worker at work because you're like, I'm not looking for the approval of man. I'm not going to show up on time because that's the approval of man. Now, that's an abuse and an heiress, uh, uh, you know, er, you know be, yeah, thank you. Every word that that applies to. You're called to be a good steward. You're called to represent the kingdom well have good character, have good ethics, good morality, all because of him. It's all in here. So don't take it to an extreme in that sense. But if it's like you're gonna change how you act, how you respond, what you say because of people, that needs to be broken. It was broken off Peter, it can be broken off of you. It made Peter, who was a coward in front of a young girl, to become one of the boldest men of Jesus' ministry. Why don't you stand? I want to pray this morning that there would be an impartation, that there would be a breaking off of the fear of man of our lives. It has to happen. It has to say, well, I don't, I'm, you know what? I'm just going to tell this cashier how much Jesus loves them. If they get upset and spit my food, so be it. I'm just kidding. They won't do that. I promise. Why don't you close your eyes? I want to pray for us right now. Father, oh, Lord, we, we only want to seek your approval, God. We only want to seek what you say. Holy Spirit, Thank you for being with us. Thank you for residing in us. Lord, as you show us, may we follow you. May we not be scared about speaking your word into a situation. Lord, I pray that you would make us all peacemakers, that you would, your peace would come upon our feet. That whatever situation we encounter, we bring your peace with it. That we would be thermostats, not thermometers. We'd be able to change the atmosphere of where we walk into because we love you so much and we see what you could do for people and for places. And so, Lord, I pray right now that you would break this fear right now in Jesus' name. Break our mindsets. Forgive us, Lord. We repent 
for assuming how people would respond and being scared about it. And Lord, we just say, wherever you go, I'll go. Whatever you do, I'll do. Whatever you say, I'll say. I commit my life to you. I just wanna fear you. I just want your approval. I just wanna have the most utmost respect for what you think about me. And Jesus, I just pray that you would just, you're the deliverer, Lord. Would you just deliver us from these, these mindsets of fear? As Paul wrote to Timothy, you've not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. We do not wanna live in this fear anymore. So we thank you for breaking it off of us, Lord. And we just dedicate and commit our lives to serving you. In Jesus' name. If, uh, if you're needing prayer for anything this morning, prayer for healing, I wanna invite you up. If you need prayer for finances and breakthrough, I wanna invite you up. If you need prayer because this message just like so spoke to you and you want that broken off of you through the laying on of hands, I want you to invite you up. If not, I mean, you guys have a wonderful week. Enjoy this awesome time God's given us. Share the love of Jesus with people you encounter this week. See what happens. And we're gonna hear testimonies about that. I, I, I know it. So bless you guys. And I will see you later.